Fenomena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Listen, I want to read some scripture with you today. I'll be reading from John chapter 5 and starting the first verse. I believe I'm going to go down probably to verse 9, I believe is where I'm going to go down to. If you've got your Bibles with you, your paper Bible, anybody has a paper Bible? Just look, oh, I do see paper Bible in the house. Miss Menis, I see you back there. That's right. That's, you get acknowledged for a paper Bible in Uplift. If you, if you have your iPhones... Other types of devices, I think that they all have, have, they all have Bibles on them now, I believe. That they all have Bibles on them now, I think. You know, we're going to pray for the other devices. But if you've got your iPhones, whatever it is, now Angelo's going to have it up here on the screen as well. We're going to be reading from John chapter 5. And there's not a lot for me to put in context. Because these verses are already in context. Uh, so I just want to read them to you. Starting at verse 1, he says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now they're in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool. It's just a little pool. Just think about it like a swimming pool, similar to uh, what's in your house. Probably look more like a kiddie sized pool. You know, you go to one of those parks and they have a little area for the kids to just kind of splash in, which, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. Now, I want you just to imagine this. Room similar to this room. You know, you've got these three areas here. You have an area back here, an area over there. It's room similar to this room. In these lay great multitude of sick people, similar to this room. Blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. They were waiting for what we just experienced in praise and worship. And, and listen, this is the amazing thing. Keisha made that open opportunity for somebody to come forward who needed some help. This is what the people were waiting on. She opened up an opportunity for somebody, anybody, who can come when the water moves. He said, it, it, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, whoever would have came down here first, I believe with all my heart, she didn't even know what I was talking about, but I believe in all my heart, whoever would have got down here first, look what he said, then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, after Keisha stirred the water, after the spirit was in here, was made well of whatever disease they had. She, had, she didn't even know we was talking about this. Of whatever disease they had, whatever you walked in here, she said it. Whatever burden you brought yourself in here with, whatever you had coming here on your back, literally on your back, you could have walked right up here in this presence, I believe it with all my heart, among all these sick people in five sections, everything we just talked about, everything I just read, I believe was going to happen for somebody in this place today. He said, now a certain man, and generally when you see certain man, this is talking about a, a Jew, somebody who would have been from the faith, of somebody who would have been growing up that would have been a Jew, was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. He was sick. He was crippled. For how long? 38 years. He was there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, he asked him this question, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man, I don't have anybody, family, I don't have anybody I can depend on to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. I wanted to come to the front, but I couldn't get to the front because my mama wasn't here to bring me up there, or my daddy wasn't here, or grandmama wasn't here. You know, that's what, that's what we kind of think sometimes. He says, but, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Look at verse 8, he says, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, walk and immediately the man was made well he was made whole his disease whatever was causing him the disease was taken away from him he took up his bed and he walked and that day was the Sabbath day father God we come to you now in the presence of your glory 
God, we come acknowledging you as the one and only true God. You are the maker of heaven and earth. You are a God of grace. You love us. You are not a God who condemns us. You are not a God who sent your son. You say clearly to condemn us, but you sent your son so that all of us who believe can have your grace. And so, God, we come praying today that you would give us the ability to just do it, God, to just, when, when, when an opportunity is open for us to walk to the front and experience your grace, to be healed, we ask you that you would give us the ability to get up, give us the will to give up, get up and get our, ourselves to the front, God. We're praying now for whatever it is that you're asking us to do in our lives, the things that we've not done, the things that you've shown us that we need to do, the things that you have shown us that we need to stop doing. We're praying, God, that you would give us the supernatural ability to just stop or to just do or whatever the case may be. Because we believe your grace, God. We believe in your grace is all the strength that we need to overcome every single thing, God. We believe that we're more than conquerors because of you and because you allowed your son to die and because he died and because he got up. Your grace covers every single thing and we can do all things. We can do all things through your grace. And so right now, God, I pray that you remove me, that you allow your Holy Spirit to begin to speak to us right now like never before, that you begin to give us everything that we need in order to do the thing that you've asked us to do. And we pray this now in the name of your Son, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And the church said amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk with you today from the, the topic of just do grace. And before I get jump into this topic, I want to share uh, an experience that I had. You know, Father's Day, one of my favorite holidays because it is a time in which I get to sit down with my children and spend some time with them. And the only thing that I ask for every year for Father's Day is that everybody just get along. I, I, you don't have to buy me a special gift. I don't need another shirt. I don't need another pair of pants. All I want is for everybody just to get along. But, but this year, this year, they had a special gift for me. See, see my brother-in-law gave me about 10 pair of designer jeans. And so most of the time on Saturday, I'm wearing these new, really nice jeans, but I've got old tennis shoes. And, you know, I'm not a tennis shoe guy. I don't care any much about tennis shoes, to be honest with you. Matter of fact, I know what these shoes are going to look like when I get through with them because I'm not a tennis shoe guy. I don't spend a lot of time clean. I don't even understand the concept of cleaning a tennis shoe. It just doesn't make, they're full walking and doing stuff and working in. I, don't, I do not understand. I was in a mall the other day, and there's a guy in the center of the mall. I'm not kidding. I'm telling the truth. He has a kiosk in the center of the mall, and all he does all day long is clean tennis shoes. He make a living off cleaning tennis shoes, and I don't think I've ever cleaned. Now, you know, in the old days, I used to put them inside the dishwasher and let the dishwasher clean them, but I've never spent any time down, you know, cleaning. You know, when they got too dirty, you know what I used to do? I don't even know if they make this anymore. I would go to the store and buy white shoe polish, and I would color, cover them with white shoe polish, but as far as getting down and scrubbing and keeping a pair of tennis shoes clean, not going to do it. And that is why I do not pay a lot of money for tennis shoes because I, don't, I do not take care of them. And I know that what's going to happen eventually, and, and I hate to say this, my kids are here, all three of them are here today. I hate to say this, but what's going to happen eventually is I am going to be in the yard on the lawnmower with these shoes on. And these shoes right here, and I think these are called uh, Air Force Ones or whatever the case, they're, they're, they're going to be green at some point. They're not going to be white for a, a long time. They'll be white as they can stay. As, listen, as long as these shoes want to be white, they better stay white because when, if they turn another color, they're going to be that color for the rest of the time. But, 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 but as I began to look at this, this shoe, and I, and I think it's amazing, I personally wear uh, all white shoe because I wear a size 14 and that just doesn't look like a space boot doesn't it look kind of big big to you uh, on my body size I, I personally don't wear white shoes but but they're right in one thing when I put this shoe on with the jeans that my brother-in-law gave me man I was shocked man I felt I wanted to wear I needed these for a prop but it took everything in me not to wear these this week 
because every time I saw these, I thought, man, I really could be sharp today. If I just put these shoes on, I really could be sharp. And, and, and so what happened, as I was going through all the packaging and everything, you know, uh, just amazed by what the kids had gotten me and, and the fact that they took the time to uh, let me know in their own special way that I'm not sharp, um, I, I saw this little tagline inside, inside of the box, inside of some of the material, and, and, and it, said, it said, just do it. And it just grabbed me. It captured me. I got to this place where I just wanted to understand everything about this. Just do it. I had seen it many times before. I had seen it over and over again. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. But, but I just wanted to understand it a little bit more. And as I began to do my research on this just do it thing, what, what Nike is saying to us is regardless of what you want to do, you can do it. All you have to do is just do it. And what they believe, this is what Nike believes, they believe that if you want to play basketball, that they've got a pair of basketball shoes and they've got the most, listen, they've got the best basketball player in the world who wears these shoes. And if you want to play basketball like this best basketball player in the world, all you have to do is come in and buy a pair of the shoes with his name on it and then you could just do it. You could just go out there and do it. If you want to run a marathon, Nike says all you have to do is come by. They have some shoes that are just meant for running marathons. They say, listen, we spend all the time. We spend all the resources. This shoe has everything that you need in order to run a marathon. All you need to do is just do it. And if you look at the people who we've got running marathons, they all wear Nikes. And the reason why they run the marathons and they're able to run them so well is because they're wearing the Nikes. And all you have to do, if you want to run a marathon, want to run it tomorrow, just do it. Come get you a pair of shoes. If you want to play football, we've got, we have a pair of cleats for you. And the best football players in the game, they wear our cleats. And if you want to play football at the highest levels, all you have to do is what? Just do it. Come get you a pair of, of, of our cleats and then go out and perform at the highest level possible. And what they're saying is, regardless of what you want to do, Regardless of what physical activity it is that you want to do, you want to do one of those mud, I don't understand this, you don't want to do one of those mud things inside of these shoes because they'll be ruined. But if you want to do one of those mud things where they lift the tires and all that stuff, they've got a pair of shoes for that as well. And the best people who do that in the world, they wear Nikes. And if you want to do that, if you want to train for that, all you have to do is get you a pair of Nikes and then and just do it. And I begin to think about this because we've been in this grace series. And this grace series has been speaking to us over and over again about the power that we have through grace, about the things we can accomplish through grace, about the situations in our life that have held us back. And because we have grace, you, you do not have to be held back. You're not under bondage to anything. You can do everything we've been talking about for six months straight. You can do it. The only thing you have to do, grace gives you everything that you need to be able to do. The only thing you have to do is just do it. The only thing, you've got everything. Just like Nike says, all you need is this pair of shoes. If you get this pair of shoes and the right attitude, you can just do it. And what I'm telling you, with God's grace and the right attitude, and the ability to go out and actually just do it, you can do anything that you've seen. You're not addicted to anything. There's nothing, there's no activity, there's no attitude, there's no behavior, there's no drug that has power over you. There is no master over you. Why? Because you're not under the law is what Paul tells us in Romans 6. But you're under grace. And because you're under grace, regardless of how hard it gets, Regardless of how difficult the situation gets in your life, all you have to do is just remember you're under grace and just do it. Just do exactly what the Word tells you to do. In every situation of your life, all you have to do is just do it. And I began to just study what the things that we've been through since January. And we've been going through this week after week since January. And the first thing I want you to do, you just got to get to the place where you believe. 
You just get to the place where you just do it. We've been talking about it week after week, almost 25 sermons on grace. I had not heard a full sermon front to end on grace in my whole. Grace was always a bullet point. Grace was always an addendum to a bigger sermon. But a full sermon on grace from beginning to end, I, I struggled to, to remember it once, maybe twice in my life. We've talked about, we've had 25 sermons. Not the same thing every week. New scripture, new verses, week after week after week on grace. And, and you just got to get to the place where you just believe it. Where you just accept that it's not about you. It's not about the mistakes that you made. You're not going to do anything outside of not believing. Believing is the important part. Look what, look what Paul tells the Ephesian church. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved. It's through what? Faith. You get the grace through faith. It's because of what you believe. And this is not from yourself. It's not about anything that you've done. It's not about what kind of shoes you wear. It's not about any place that you go. It's not about anything that you say. It's not about how many incense you burn. It's not about any of that kind of stuff. It's all about what you believe. Do you believe? Do you believe that Christ rose from the dead? Do you believe he died for you? Do you believe that he rose for you? Do you believe? But we still get ourselves in a place where we believe instead of believing in Christ, instead of believing in grace, we believe in ourselves. We believe in what we did and what we're doing. We begin to look at what we did and what we're doing, and we begin to think, listen, if we're real with ourselves, we begin to think, how can a God of grace give me grace when I keep making the same mistake over and over again? And that's why Paul so eloquently says, it's not from yourself. It's not about anything you did right or wrong. Surely if it was about us, none of us could get in. But that, then it wouldn't be called grace. The reason why it's called grace is because it is a gift from God, not works, so that no one can boast. And we've got to get, you, you just have to do it. What you believe, you just have to say it over and over again. I believe in Christ. I believe he rose from the dead. And, and listen to me. There's some of us that are saying that, but we don't believe it. There's some of us who've been saying that for years and years and years, and we don't understand it, and we don't believe it. And now is the time for you to do it, for you to get yourself into position. Now, now what does Paul say? Is, Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. And so what you've got to do, you've got to get your, if you just want to do it, if you just want to believe it, you've got to get yourself in a situation where you get underneath the word, where you just hear and hear and hear and hear and hear the word, where you read the word, where you study the word, where you pray over the word. But, but, but not only do we have to just do believing, but you have to put your belief into practice. If you believe that God died for your sin, that's what you believe. This, this, this is how I know that some of us don't believe because we have trouble forgiving others. If you believe in your heart that God died for your sins, that God actually allowed himself to die so that you can be made free, then, then what you have to do is you have to get to this place where you get rid of all bitterness. Where you let go of anything, any, listen, I know people have hurt you. I know there's some pain. I know there have been some things that have happened in your life, indescribable things. I am not trying to say in any way the way anybody treated you was right. But what I am telling you is when we believe in a God who forgave us, when we believe in a God who laid his life down for us, even though we messed up, we believe in a God, we believe that we're justified by our faith, not by what we did. We don't require other people to do certain things in order for us to forgive them. We get to a place where we get rid of all bitterness. We get rid of all rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. We don't do things to get back to people. We don't try to get our justice in this world. We allow for God to have his justice. And you know what instead what we do? We treat them kind. We get to this place that regardless of what somebody has done to us, we treat them kind, and we just do it. And you just get to a place. Stop trying to figure it out. You just do it. Just be kind. Just forgive. Just let it go. Just, just move on. Just stop fussing. Just stop allowing yourself to be angry. Just make a decision, and you've got to just do it. You've got to get to the place where you say, I am not going to just get angry and go off and tell people off. I'm not going to continue to hold a grudge against somebody. What I choose to do is to be kind and to be compassionate to one another, not just the people around me, but actually forgiving each other just as Christ He forgave us. 
And we, when we believe, we get to this place where we understand believing is doing. We, we just do it. We just forgive everybody. Regardless of what they've done to us, we just let it go. We just get to this place in our lives where we just simply let it go. And we get rid of all the bitterness and all this rage and all this anger. And we focus on being kind and we focus on being compassionate to everybody. And you just have to do it. And not just forgiving others, but you've got to get to the place where you forgive yourself. And, and, and when Christ got, died and gave us grace, he gave us the ability to forgive ourselves. As a matter of fact, Paul go as far, goes as far as to say in Romans 8 and 1 that there's no condemnation. There's no reason for you to be up beating yourself up for something you did years ago or even last week. There is absolutely no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. We've all made some mistakes. We've all been forgiven for those mistakes. And not only do you forgive when you believe, not only do you forgive other people, but you have to get to the place where you literally forgive yourself, where you literally let go of some of that bitterness and some of that hurt and some of that anger that you have against yourself. Listen, your ears should never hear you condemning yourself from your own mouth. And we just have to do it. We just have to get to the place where we are no longer our worst critic. And listen to me, let me just talk to you for a second because there's nothing wrong with accountability. There's nothing wrong with holding yourself accountable. There are some things that you need to do. There are some things that we all need to do right. But we don't get into this place of condemnation where we tear ourselves down and we begin to compare ourselves to other people and we begin to tear our own selves down. You just have to do it. You just have to get to the place where you say, listen, I'm saved by grace. I've made some mistakes. God has forgiven me. I'm justified through my faith. It's not about anything that I did. There's no sin that I could have done that could have stopped me from being justified through my faith. At the moment that I believed, I became justified. That means that all my sins were washed away. At the moment that I believed, I became rec God is not angry with me. I'm reconciled to him is what Paul tells this Roman 5 church that we've been going through. He says, the moment that you have faith, you became reconciled and you are at peace with God. God's not punishing you. He's not trying to hurt you. But, but, but not only do you have to forgive yourself and you just have to do it, but you have to get to this place where you accept yourself. Look what Paul says to the Corinthian church. He says, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. I am who I am by the grace of God. Listen, God created me to be this person that I am now. He did not create me to be the person that everybody's been comparing me to or the person that society has put out there as the model for what it looks like to be a 45, 46-year-old man. He created me out of his own grace. He created me. I am who I am. I may not be like this other person. I may not be like this other pastor. I may not be like this other man. I am what I am by the grace of God. I don't have to compare. I accept who I am. I accept who God created me to be. I am adequate. For, I, know, I know what God created in me. And, and it's his grace. Listen, he says, toward me. I didn't take it for vain. So I get up every day. And I try my best to be the best person that I can be in Christ. Look what he says. But, but, but not for me, but, but for Christ. And so every day I get to this place where I accept myself. I'm not trying to change myself into some image of what society would have me be. But I get to this place in my life where I accept myself. And then every day of my life I get up and I try harder. Just to be what Christ wants me to be. Just to be what God wants me to be. And I'm not doing it for the world. And I'm not doing it for a man. And I'm not doing it even to impress myself. But I'm doing it because I want to be the very, I don't take in vain what God has done for me. And I want to be the very best that I can be every day of my life. And you just have to do it. You just have to accept yourself. You, you, you have to get to this place where you just be free. And you just do it. Look, look, look what Paul tells the Galatian church. He said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You're free. There's no chain on you. There's no addiction that's holding you. There's no person over you. You are free because of the grace of God. He says, so what you need to do, you need to get to this place where you just be free, where you just stand firm in your freeness, where you just do not allow yourself to be burdened, where you just don't allow yourself to go back. He says, don't go back to the yoke of slavery ever again. You make a decision that I am free and you never go back again. And because of God's grace, you have the ability to just do it. You don't need anybody else to pray for you. You don't need another scripture read to you. You have the ability right now to break every single... Listen, you're not even breaking chains. The chains have already been broke. 
That's all bad. Listen, all that's just bad, bad theology. The chain, you're not tied down once you receive grace. Those songs are for the people that haven't been saved. They're not for you that have been saved. There is not a chain on you. You're already, you're already free. But in order to be free, you've got to just do it. Not only do you need to be free, but, but you've got to get to this place where you're under self-control, where you be self-controlled. You get to this place, look what, look what Titus says. He says, for the grace of God, talking about grace, has appeared and offers salvation to all. I look this, all, this word all up in every time. I look this word all up every time in the Greek just to make sure I'm not missing anything. This word all means everybody in this room who's received grace. What, what does this all mean? What are you, what are you saying, Titus? That the grace that you receive, it teaches you how to say no. You don't have to figure out what to say no to or how to say no. It teaches you how to say no. But what it's saying is you know the difference between right and wrong when it comes to things that are ungodly. You know what ungodly things are. The grace of God has already taught you everything that you need to know. You have this thing called self-control. You have the ability to identify those things that are called worldly passions, those things that are going to pull you away from God. And you have the ability inside of you. You don't need another, you don't have to go to another seminar. You don't need to go to another class. When you accepted Christ in your life, the grace of God came inside of you and it gave you the ability to say no to everything that you don't need to say yes to. And it also gave you the ability to say yes to everything that you need to say yes to. And it says it gave you the ability to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives, not tomorrow, not when you finish the class. Not when you come back from the couple's ministry meeting. Not when, you, not when you get through the men's ministry class. Not when you read the book. Right now in the present age. Not when you get finished with this, this issue that you've been dealing with. No, no, no. Right now in the present age. You have everything that you need right now to, to just do it. But, but you have to do it. You have to, just, you have to just do it. You have to just be self-controlled. You have the ability to be strong right now. You don't need another song saying. You don't need another prayer pray. When you receive the grace of God, he says, you then, my son, be strong in what? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You have everything that you need. You do not have to have another pity party. You do not have to walk around and be, listen, there's nothing wrong with weaknesses. We, we need to understand that it's in, in our weaknesses that grace comes in and becomes more, it becomes sufficient for us, becomes more than everything. All the power that we need is inside of our weaknesses. But don't confuse this. Just because you have weaknesses doesn't mean you're weak. There's a difference between being weak and having weaknesses. I know some handicapped people who are some of the strongest people that I have ever met in my life to get up and do the things that they have to do in a society that's not catered toward them. And I meet people with legs that work, arms that work, mouths that work, who sit around and complain and whine. And I'm looking at these handicapped people who never complain. Who are, who are strong as anybody has, that I've ever met in my life, just because we have weaknesses doesn't make us weak. As a matter of fact, you are strong. You, all you have to do, you've got to get to this place where you just be strong. Just do it. Just allow for the strength of God to be on the inside of you. Listen, you've got to get to this place, and you just have to do it, where you're not fearful anymore. Well, you're not always worried. How am I going to pay this? How am, what's, what's next month going to bring? What's going to happen on my job? You know, we just constantly, Paul says, don't worry about anything but in everything, through prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to make make your request known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. But instead of doing that, don't worry about anything. We just worry, 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 worry. We're just concerned. We're just overly concerned. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And look, look what Paul tells Timothy. He says, "God didn't give you that spirit." That's the spirit of fear. That didn't have anything to do with grace. When God, when grace came inside of you, what really came inside of you was power, was love, and was a sound mind so that you could make the right decisions. This, this whole thing about fear, that's coming from another spirit. That's coming from the spirit of evil. God did not give you that. Inside of you is grace. And because of grace, you can just be fearless. But listen, you have to do it. You have to make a decision 
that you're not going to be scared about bills. You're not going to be scared about what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next week. You're not going to be scared about the job. You're not going to be scared about what's going on in the election with Russia and what's going on in South Korea. You're not going to allow for yourself to sit around in fear, but you're just going to be that you're just going to be brave. You're just going to be full of power, going to be full of love, and going to be full of sound, a sound mind. But in order to do it, you have to just do it. And, and, and I start to look at this because over and over again, Paul points back to Philippians 4 and 13. What Paul says is, I can just do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can just do anything. It doesn't matter what the situation is in my life. Paul literally says, I rejoice. I get happy in tribulations. Why? Because I know that God's going to be working that tribulation, that he's going to take that tribulation and that that tribulation is going to create perseverance on the inside of me. I'm going to get stronger because of the tribulation, that the, that the perseverance is going to lead to character, that people are going to begin to know me by the things that I went through and then quit that that character is going to actually teach me about hope and going to lead me to hope. And so the things that I'm going through today in my marriage are not even for my marriage, they're for my grandkids. I'm getting stronger right now. So years from now, years from now, when the situation arises and it needs for me to be hopeful and it needs for me to be strong and it needs for me to just do grace, to just get to this place where I can just do grace, I'll be ready for it and I'll be strong for it. And what Paul does in this verse, he begins to say, we can do, you can do, you can just do it. Just like Nike says, you can just do it. You can do all things because Jesus did it. What, what Paul says is, you can do all things because of Christ who strengthened you. And what he's saying is, because Christ died for you, and because you received this grace on the inside of you, regardless of the situation that you find yourself in, regardless of what challenge you want to go after, regardless of what tribulation you find yourself in, regardless of what substance you find yourself entangled in, what trap you find yourself entangled in, regardless of the situation of your life, you can do all things through Christ because he did it, because he allowed himself to be killed, because he rose from the dead. Because he's living on the inside of you. Because the Holy Spirit is residing on the inside of you. Regardless of the situation that you find yourself in, you can do it. But, but, but listen, it comes down to this. You, you, you have to just do it. And I want you to think about this for a second. Because in John chapter 5, we read about a group of people, much like us. Five sections full of sick people, right? Right? Five sections full of people, everybody coming to the same place in order that they may receive some kind of healing, in order that they may be whole. Five different areas, an area much like this right here, three sections out here, two sections up here. And everybody just sitting around and they're looking to be touched by this angel, to be touched by the Spirit of the Lord. They're looking for their life to be changed. They're looking for, uh, for, the, for themselves to be healed from whatever their disease is, whether it's mentally, physically, spiritually. They're all looking for healing. And it's no different than this room we find ourselves in. We've, we've got five sections. The, the sections in this church are full of sick people. You've you got some people who are having trouble walking. They, 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 they just can't get up and do it. God is telling you to do it. God is telling you. He was even telling you in the instance that Keisha was up here, calling you to the front. He's saying, get up and go. And you, you, your leg, you, you are crippled. You cannot make your legs get up and do what Christ wants you to do with them. And, and in some instances, you know, crippled is just not when, you, when your legs won't move. But there's a lot of people who are crippled because their legs won't stop moving. And for some of us, we keep going places and keep doing that, keep taking our bodies to places where we have no business going. We keep on making ourselves to play, go to places where God has clearly told us not to go. For some of us, it's hands, right? God wants you to help people. God wants you to go out and serve people. He wants you to use your hands to make a difference. And, and, and listen, you've you got a hundred different excuses. You're crippled with your hands, with your servant. You have just convinced yourself that... You know, you don't have time, you got kids, you got this going on, you got all these different things going on, work's going on, and you are crippled. And then there's some of us who, we can't stop our hands. We're touching too many people and touching too many things that we have no business touching. There's some of us in this room, just like in that setting, I want you to imagine, some of us are mute. We, 
God's been telling you to say something to somebody, been telling you to, to use a different kind of vernacular, and then there's some people in here just like, just like the opposite of that who can't stop talking. You cannot stop saying the thing that God has told you to stop saying. There's some people in this room, you can't hear, I'm talking right now. You hear words, but you don't know what, you, you don't bit more understand what I'm talking about. I'm making this as plain as I possibly can, and you don't, you, you don't bit more know. Understand, and I, I use that expression lovingly. You don't bit more know what I'm talking about. You can't even begin to see that you crippled. You can't begin to see. What are you talking about? I can walk around. I walked in here. I walked down here. Everybody in this room, everybody wants healing. Everybody wants to be different. Everybody wants to do something different. Everybody wants to serve God. Everybody wants the grace that is present in this place. And Jesus walks into this man, just like I'm walking into you today. He looks at this man. He asks a simple question. Do you want to be healed? Do, do you want to change? We've been in this series for six months. We've been talking about grace, and you still haven't let go of that thing that you know God wants you to let go. Do you, do you want to be changed? You, you've been, God's been calling you. He's been pulling you into some kind of ministry. He's been pulling to you in some kind of works. He's been trying to pull you for years, and you're still sitting there. Do you want to be healed? God's been trying to change a behavior. He's been trying to change an attitude. He's put person in front of you after person in front of you, and everybody has confirmed exactly what God wants to do. And the question comes down to, do you want to be healed? What, what Jesus is asking this man who is laying there and been laying there for 38 years, he asks him a simple question. It's the same question that I'm asking each and every one of you. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to do what it is that God has called you to do? Do you want to go to the next place in grace? Do you want to understand what it means to be under his grace, as Paul says, to stand in grace? Do you want to understand? Do you want to change your behavior? Do you want to be the new person, the new creation? Do you want to be kind to people? Or do you want to just be mean to people and ugly to people? Do you want to forgive people? Or do you want to hold a grudge for the rest of your life? Because Paul, because just like Jesus tells this man, if, if you want to do it, you can do it. All you have to do is just do it. If you want to get up and walk, all you have to do is get up and walk. You could have got up and walked a long time ago. All you have to do is get up and walk. If you want to do it, all you have to do is just do it. And if you want to do something different, if you want to be everything that God has called you, if you want to experience his grace, if you want to go to that next level in your relationship with Christ, all you have to do is just do it. And what the brother James does, he, he shows us these quick couple of things about what it means to just do. James is a doer. If you want to read anything about being a disciple, about following Christ, about being a man or a woman in Christ, I would highly recommend spending time in James. This is the brother of Jesus. In his most important chapter, the first chapter, he writes how we do it. Look what he says. He says the first thing we have to do. You need to remove all obstacles from just doing it. You've got things in your way. He says, get rid of all filth, all that mess. Get rid of all that evil that's in your life. Get rid of all those talk shows, television programs. Get rid of all that extra stuff you done signed up for so you look busy. And when you really ain't busy, when you really just get rid of all that stuff. He says, get rid of all that filth, all that extra stuff you got in your life and get yourself to the place where you accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your soul. He says, the first step you got to do is you got to get rid of all this extra filth, all this stuff that's pulling you in every direction. You don't know whether you're going or you're coming. You got so much on your plate and none of it means anything. Listen, if you were to stop doing half of the things that, you, that you're doing now, nobody would even call you. If you were to stop going to half of the places where you're going now and volunteering for half of the stuff that you're doing now, nobody would even miss you. He says not just get to this place where you remove all the obstacles that stop you from just doing, but, but you've got to get to this place where you understand. You need to understand what it means to just do. He says, but, but don't just listen. 
Listen, it's time out. We've been coming to church six months. We've been talking about grace, almost 25 sermons. It's time to stop just listening to it. I've been bringing in something like this every week so you can understand it. I've been breaking this thing down as low as I can possibly break it down. But if you're just listening to it and not doing it, you're fooling yourself is what James said. He says you must actually do it. You've got to actually get to the place where you do it. I know it sounds good, and I know it makes you feel good sometimes when we leave this place. You feel so good about grace and about who you are, but if you're not applying this stuff to your life, you're fooling yourself. He says, otherwise, you are fooling yourself. If you come in here every week for 25 weeks listening to these sermons and you've not changed anything in your life, you're not doing anything. You've not implemented anything. Not one sermon on grace. You're not doing anything different. You're just fooling. You're just wasting your own time. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. And, and what he does, he uses this, this analogy. He says, if you just listen to the word and you don't do anything with it, it's this crazy. As you walking into a mirror and looking at a mirror and you got mess all over your mouth, food all over your mouth, you got all crust all in your mouth. And instead of you actually doing something with your foul, dirty mouth, you just walk and go to work. And you just show up at work with all this stuff in your mouth and all this stuff in your, you got stuff in your teeth, stuff in your mouth. And listen, and you make it difficult for the people that you work with because everybody trying to figure out, should I say something about his mouth or not? Should I say something? And what he's saying is, if you got a foul mouth and you at work cussing all the time and you, listen, the word has shown you that you got a foul mouth, you got a negative mouth, you got an issue going on with your words, with the things that you're saying, you got an abusive mouth, whatever the case is, your mouth, your words do not line up with the word of God and you look in a mirror and you see that and you go out the house and you continue to talk that way, he said that is just crazy. That's a person who hears the word and, and they see, listen, I'm having troubles seeing, I got this crust in my eyes. And instead of cleaning the crust out of your eyes, you just walk out the house and go to work. And now you're walking around, you got all this crust in your eyes. Instead of dealing with the issue that you have seeing things, you just walk around with crust in your eyes. You got this, all this wax in your ears. You can't hear God. You can't hear what people are saying. You, you, don't, you can't hear what people are saying around you. You don't have compassion. You don't have empathy. And the Bible is telling you, listen, you need to do something about your ears. And instead of you doing something about you, you walk out the house with wax and hair and all kind of stuff in your ears. And, and, and what, God, what, what James is saying through, what God is saying through James, it doesn't even make sense. He says, you need to understand that the reason that I put this word in front of you is so it can be a mirror to you, so you can see the issues that you have. And then once you see the issues that you have, he, he goes to verse 25, he says, you, you, you just got to just do it. You just got to do whatever you saw in the word, whatever issue you saw. If you saw something on your mouth, get a napkin, clean your mouth off, get a wet one, whatever, whatever you need. If you saw something on your nose, if you saw something, listen, in your ear, if you saw something on your eye, just clean yourself up. Begin to work on cleaning yourself up. He says you got to get to this point, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free. You know, I know we try to think that the law binds us up and the law causes us not to, to, to have fun, can't have fun in the law and all this stuff crazy foolishness that we say about the law. But the reality of it is you want to be free. Start living under the law, God. You want to free yourself from all the consequences that you're dealing with now? The thing that has you sitting at home now crying is probably because somebody broke the law, some law of God. Somebody's not operating. Somebody's not just doing the word of God. If you want to move that junk out of your life, you want to be free, just, just, start, just start walking in the word of God. He says, and if we, if we, look what he said, if we do what it says and don't forget what we heard, then God will bless you for doing it. He says that each and every one of us, it's as simple as this. We can't just be people who hear the word and don't do it. He says, but, but what he wants, what, this is what Christ wants. If we want to experience grace, if we want to go to that next level, if we want to be, look what he says, if we want to be among those people who are being blessed, who are seeing the blessings of grace in their life, you've actually got to get to the place where you just do it, where you just say, listen, I'm not going back to that spot. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to allow this thing to hold me, to bind me up because I'm free. I'm not going to quit. Why? Because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ, because I can do all things. I'm not going to allow myself to 
to be pulled away from God. Why? Because I can say no. Why? Because I have the grace of God living on the inside of me. Regardless of the situation that I have going on in my life, I can do it. I can be the man that God wanted me and created me to be. Why? Because of his grace. Because I just do his grace. I can be the mother, the father. I can be the person that God created me to be. Why? Because of his grace. Not because of my own strength. Not because I'm smart. Not because I work hard. Not because I'm sinning less. But because of his grace. And because of his grace that works on the inside of me, I can do all things is what he said. So, so this week, real simple. I want you to get this in your spirit. Because Jesus did it, I can just do it. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what you're faced with. Because Jesus did it, what did he do? He died for us. Because Jesus died for us, there's not a sin that I won't be forgiven for. All I have to do is forgive myself and forgive other people. All I have to do is believe. And because I know that Jesus did it, all I have to do is just do it. Because Jesus did it, listen, worldly passions, sins and stuff like that, you got to make some mistakes, sure. But being under something, being addicted, being chained to something, no, because Jesus did what he did, there won't ever be a chain on any of you under grace. There won't ever be anything that'll stop you from coming back to God or separate you from the love of God. Not anything in this world, not, not anything in the present, not anything in the future. What you need to understand is, because Jesus did it, regardless of what you're going through and what you're suffering with, all you have to do is just do it. So here's the question. Do you want to do it? Do you want to change? Do you want to be a different creation? Do you want grace flowing on the inside of you? Do you want to grow in grace? Do you want to get closer to God? Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to change lives? Do you want to change your life. Do, do you want to be well? Do you want to be everything that God has created you to be? Because if you want to be it, all you have to do is get up, pick up your mat, walk. To God be the glory. Amen. It's an honor, and it's an honor to lift our voice and sing to the living God. To the living God. No one can deny. No one can deny that Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ.